you know, I mean, it's basically paying attention. It's like liking people. It's like liking life. It's just, you take joy in the randomness and the, you know, the chance operation of everyday life. That's what street photography is. You go out on the street and you don't have any particular thing in mind. Any average person that goes out there to take pictures is because they love it, you know? And that's always been, I think, a distinctive ingredient, and that is we're going to take pictures even if people don't pay us. And that's almost like a classification or a definition of a certain kind of photographer, artist. The voice is in you, but there's also the voice of the culture. You are getting good in street photography as a function to which you analyze the cultural, social realities in the moment that you live in. We have this inner drive, a compassion, an obsession to do in this case, street pictures. Uh, it's what makes us excited. We do it like some people wake up and they draw. You know, we, we wake up and somehow figure out our day to be able to go out and make street photographs. Photography is, is the shutter of a camera, freezes a moment. So the moment is not even the moment that most people see. You can't stop time, but a camera can stop time. So the camera is an extension of your sight, but you can't do what a camera does. You know, it freezes something. You don't see that way. Only cameras do that. So street photography is the art of the instant. I really gravitate towards black and white because I love that it's so stripped down. It just, it, color is just gorgeous, but it does, it can kind of steal the show sometimes for me. But sometimes you make a photograph and it just demands to be in color. I'm more drawn to black and white for the, the impact and the just drama. And also I'm very much influenced by vintage photography. The black and white kind of gives a timeless feel. So before I started photography, I was a painter and I went to school for fine art. And I always loved photography, but I was mostly focused on painting and drawing. I was really passionate about it and always was gonna grow up and be an artist. So I did, I was an art geek in high school and always did art, painting, drawing, sculpture woodwork, metalwork, the whole, all, anything you can think of, I tried. With painting, it's a, a longer process and it's a very singular kind of solitary process. You're alone and you're in a studio, in a room, you have your paint and your canvas and it, it's kind of almost indulgent in a hermit kind of way, whereas photography, and especially street photography, you get to be out on the street, you get to walk, you get to breathe the air, you hear the sounds, you see the people, you're engaging, you're talking to people, and the results are much more immediate. It's a bit easier in modern times to share the work, to be social, to have a community, to talk about it. You can do that with, with painting, but it's more studio visits and you have a few friends over, you have a gallery owner over. With photography, it's just, it's so easy to be out there. So it's just much more engaging. I found myself outside of restaurants a lot and I really love working with glass and reflections. It, it, I love how it abstracts and creates these layers. And I found myself very much drawn to uh, shooting women working in restaurants. And um, I was a waitress during college and graduate school. Seeing these women in these jobs was very, it resonated with me very much. I felt I related to them so much. I so often see them, since I'm looking in the window, I'd see them gazing out of the window, taking a moment to have a daydream or to be thinking about something or remembering something, just taking a little mental break from their work. And I just thought, oh, what are they thinking and what are they doing and what are they in New York? Like, did this person come to New York from someplace else? Do they have dreams? Are they, you know, an actress? Are they, whatever their dreams are, what are they doing? And I just thought, like, it's so, such a magical 
moment to kind of be in New York City and have like your whole life and world in front of you and it's so exciting and it became a whole series of, of waitresses at work. I love shooting in Grand Central Station. It's such a dynamic place. The architecture is so stunning. It's one of my th probably three favorite big buildings in New York City. It's very timeless and it's classic and it's identifiable and it's a hub and I mean metaphorically it's just it's this beautiful place where all of these people come and go and there's so much so much happening in there. It's such a beehive. And the light is beautiful in there. The streams into the windows in the morning with such drama and it plays against the architecture so well. There's a noise in there, there's a hum. It's re it really is like a beehive. You can just feel the energy and there's trains and there's conductors and it's, it's so dynamic. You know, when you take a photograph, it's this split second in time and it's, it's not really fiction or nonfiction. It's, it's just this brief moment that could be anything and anything could actually be happening. So to me, it's like this moment that you can capture and from there a whole other story can, can happen and there can be uh, as many stories can emerge from this one split second as people who view the photograph want to create. I'm originally from Athens, Greece, and I am a street photographer. I actually came here in 2005. I mean, you know, New York is one of those places that are doomed large in the collective imagination, I think, everywhere in the world, because, you know, you're just bombarded with images of New York through film and TV, and the one who really hit a nerve with me was Gary Winogrand. Just opened my eyes to the possibilities of actually creating something with artistic value out of everyday life. I really wanted to come here and try to do street photography, but at the same time, you know, needed to find a more seemingly mature reason to come here. So, you know, I done some undergraduate work in psychology and I thought it might be a good uh, idea to come here to do a PhD, which I did. But on some level, that was the excuse to be here and do street photography. After I moved here, it took me almost a year and a half to actually start taking pictures, even though that had been my hidden agenda. Street photography for me is something that's emotionally very difficult and challenging to do. You know, it takes some kind of courage in a way to go out in the street and take photos of strangers. Part of the style I'm trying to pursue is something that balances form and content and contains both of those to make the photograph interesting. That's something that develops organically Partly because of the architecture of New York and the layout of the grid, I discovered deep blacks and shadows and like deep contrast between highlights and shadows just because of how the city works and how the, uh, you have those areas of sunlight and you know next to that you might have like a patch of darkness. Black and white photo work, street photography in particular from the 70s is very hot right now. Um, there's not a lot of people who've done it. He's sitting on a gold mine of work as far as I'm concerned. He photographed New York City in a way that no one else has and we haven't seen all that work yet. I mean, it, a, a lot of it is still largely unseen. Very few photographers have this ability to walk the streets, 
and come upon something that they know is going to be a, a frame of some unusual activity, something of interest, either in the subject itself or the pairing, you know, of the subject with its surroundings. Um, that's what makes uh, Richard's work, you know, exceptional. Joel's work, one term that I apply to his work is that they're very athletic. That is to say, you can tell from the photograph that this person had an incredible kind of poise, an almost balletic ability to put himself in the place to get that picture. That things were moving very quickly on the street and that he had the kind of coordination, physical coordination to begin with, as well as mental coordination to recognize that there's a picture there. Vivian Meyer had a unique and very secretive personality. She's a very paradoxical addition to the history of photography because part of what made her photography great was its privacy, was the fact that she didn't share it with other people, the fact that it was sort of her secret life, the fact that she didn't, you know, that she collected the stuff for herself but didn't really show it to anyone. She didn't get an interaction, a public response, a critique of the work. In some ways, as a result of that, she, she developed in unique ways, but in some ways very limited in her vision. Probably the most important street photographer was Helen Levitt very, very important in the 30s and 40s. She looked at kids in the street and made pictures of what was happening there. Helen Levitt's work is compelling to me because, primarily because of the children. You know, she was able to, I think, both as a product of the time in which she shot, but also by virtue of being a woman. You know, she was able to become very intimate with children on the street. She was able to get very close and she was able to make very candid photographs of children, which we just don't see anymore. She photographed over a long period of time and she was also a wonderful colleague and a very encouraging colleague and a helpful colleague to many photographers of her time, most especially Walker Evans. Bill Eggleston is someone who has a very different kind of intuition. He's um, really a photographer who documents Southern culture. He's interested in the distinctive culture of the South. Also an example of the way in which any kind of a complex character, any kind of complex view of life in certain situations be armed with a camera to respond to life. Pictures of drive-ins that are in the South that's really what he photographs. Eggleston's really important for color photography. He's, he's really the person who started looking at color and taking it seriously and making a wonderful body of material about seeing the world in color. A truly great photographer like Alex Webb goes after something deliberate and then he waits for the chance element to enter, but he does it brilliantly. I mean, he knows exactly how to do it. And time and time again, it comes through in his frames to make incredibly compelling photographs. Another thing about Webb is that he is clearly a master when it comes to editing. A truly great photographer like Alex Webb might understand that you can go out for a weekend and not make any photographs that are ever going to be seen because it just didn't happen. To be able to have that kind of self-control along with that keen sense, visual sense, to do your own editing so well, it involves a lot of detachment. You have to detach the emotion that you felt at the moment of making the photograph, but Alex Webb does that and that's why he is, is a master photographer. Gary Winogrand has been a great influence on how we see the world. His sense of immediacy, his sense of contact with people, his sense of just recording what's on the street and its awkwardness and its amazingness. Like all street photographers, his ability to be sensitive to, to be responsive to the kind of 
craziness, at least visual craziness, that everyday life in the street, everyday life in public presents. But the other thing about Winogrand was that he was very aggressive. That is to say, he, he had a personality that was very large. When he took a picture, often he, in the process of getting a candid scene, he disturbed the scene, I think, because of the fact that he was physically aggressive, too. He's done maybe more than anyone else has done for a language of street photography that we now all share. So I like to tell stories. I have a mantra, fill the frame, tell a story. I was a corporate attorney working in-house for various investment banks for 16 years. Was that my dream job? Do you want me to be honest? <laughs> I grew up having a lot of passions, but I didn't know that I could channel any of those into something, into a job. Never even thought of it. So I was a good student. I had strong opinions. My teachers, my parents told me I'd be a good lawyer. And there was always the message, and you'll be secure financially. And that was something I was raised that that was important. So I decided to become a lawyer. I actually knew before, when I was graduating college, that I didn't want to go to law school, but I was too afraid to go travel, which is really what I wanted to do, and go live abroad. But I had, no, I had no structure, and it was too scary for me. I didn't know that I was unhappy. I, I, could, like, I couldn't read this language that parts of me were trying to communicate. I'm very good at just doing what I have to do, so I just did it. There was this responsible side of me that was winning out. I did like certain aspects of it. I liked engaging with people. I liked, there was intellectual stimulation, but most of it was pretty banal and stressful um, because there was such an importance placed on certain things that I didn't think were that important. And I always knew something I was not completely satisfied. It was always about money. In corporate investment banking, that's really what it's about. I, my, my soul was kind of dimming. And when I realized it was at the last job I had, I could not get out of bed in the morning. That started getting me thinking, hmm, maybe this isn't, <laughs> this really isn't, isn't right. I always had dreams about finding ways to travel, finding ways to do something creative, but I didn't focus on them. I just thought they'll just happen because focusing on them would have made it, I think, made me realize how unhappy I was. And I didn't want to deal with that. Uh, sometimes when you focus on what you want and you don't have it, it feels worse than just kind of keeping it to the side. That's when I went traveling for six months and said to myself, I am not going back to doing law. So let me take six months, travel, and I'll, I'll figure it out then. I figured if I'm going to travel, I want to take pictures. So maybe it's a good idea to learn how to take photos properly instead of putting the camera on automatic. So I took a crash course in photography before I left. That was the planted seed. That was the beginning. And when I went traveling, forget it. I was in love with photography. And it's easy when you're abroad, everything's new and fresh. So I was photographing constantly, but it also kept me very present because I was concentrating on every little detail around me. And it really, when I came back to New York, I woke up like noticing the banal things that I didn't notice every day, I was noticing because I had my camera with me. 
So, I mean, these are two faces and they're so distinctly different. <laughs> um, and that's Coney Island. Everybody goes here. So I loved that for that. Uh, I just love this whole gesture. You know, boy, like talking to mommy. And I thought it had a, a nice energy. This is one of those scenes where you don't know what's going on, but there's so much going on. And they, it doesn't give, doesn't tell you everything. But to me, there's just, there's a lot of energy in this photo. My Coney Island series started in 2013. It started out as just a place for me to go. And then I was getting pictures that I really liked, so I kept going back. But they were street photographs. They had nothing to do with Coney Island. They were separate photographs. And then I started seeing it as a project because it was one place. So it became my Coney Island project. And then I thought, well, everybody does Coney Island, so how could this be a project? I got some of my best photos the first day. I think I got f four or five photos that are still in this project that will always be in this project. And to get that many in one day is, is kind of crazy. I mean, if I get one good photo every few months now, it's, it's great. Anywhere, not even just Coney Island. I went there with a completely open mind. I went there not thinking I was going to find anything because of all of that before me. I mean, I just, I, w I needed to get away. I was really in a funk and I love the beach. So I needed to get away. And that's just brought my camera as praying, maybe I'll find something, but I didn't think I would. So I had no agenda, zero, which made it, and that's what helped me. And that's what made probably why I loved it so much because I found something so unexpectedly with street photography, there's a lot of hunting where you're just, your brain turns on, you get hyper alert. You're always looking for the next shot or the next scene. And I do that sometimes, but sometimes I just like to enjoy my walk and just zone out. The most important sort of shaping of the history after the war really came from Robert Frank's book, The Americans. Frank's photography has started to show us things about ourselves that were less polished. We're taking a more critical look at, at the world, at Americans and American society. Also, in many ways, Robert Frank's book, The Americans, gained a kind of attention for street photography that was very stimulating, though at first negative. When the book was first published, there were reviews of it that said, you know, this is really a terrible view of America. This guy uh, is, you know, tearing the country apart in the way that he photographs it and so forth and so on. But the amount of controversy it caused nevertheless widened the audience and ultimately had a beneficial effect. Somebody once said, you know, you can only see what you're ready to see, that we were ready at that time, in the 60s particularly, we were ready to start seeing photography that was, you know, a little bit rougher around the edges. Another important stepping stone in distributing street photography to the public at large was the appointment of John Zarkowski as the curator at the Museum of Modern Art in 1962. He does a show called New Documents, which was of Gary Winogrand, Lee Friedlander, and Diane Arbus, all of whom were street photographers and whose street photography was, was the subject of the exhibition. Those photographs spoke to me, introducing that work in a museum setting was huge. In putting street photography forward at that time and in a venue like MoMA, put a rubber stamp on street photography and said, this is art. He worked uh, to clarify photography as a form of art with its own laws and its own characteristics, like painting. It was at the same time we, what we call formalism in painting. Painting was being examined for its quality of flatness or brushwork. 
Street photography was always for him a kind of core of what photography was about because of his knowledge and his shrewdness about the history of photography, but because of his personality, he was someone who did attract attention to the medium and to street photography in particular. He was looking at the qualities that make photographs photographs. Um, the way uh, mo the time element is part of photography, an intrinsic part, part of photography, or the vantage point is a part of photography. All these particular characteristics to making a picture. You could see that photographic history had moved on beyond the things that interested him. Postmodernism never interested him, but it was being uh, shown in various museums uh, and was attracting a lot of attention in the press, partly because it was something that was developing the aesthetics, not just of photography, but of painting and of architecture. Architecture is really where theories of postmodernism began. Street photography's moment of of silence in the in the 90s simply because Zarkovsky retired but again it's more of, of a confluence of events is a shift in consciousness in in society so this was after I had you know encountered Winogrand's uh, work obviously but you know it was the first book I the first book of his and the first photo book I, I bought I think, you know, Winogrand's work is always inspiring. I'm not going to say I look at this book every week or every month, but, you know, whenever I do, it's like um, I'm so familiar with his photos, and then they, you know, each time, you know, they pack such a, a punch still. I mean, they're just powerful. I remember when I first saw street photography in an early class at ICP. We all went to the Modern Museum of Art. Gary Winogrand's pictures were pointed out. And they were in the midst of all these beautiful landscapes and portraits. And I thought, what the fuck is he doing here? Anyone could do this. I could do this. They're, they're they're not nice looking, they're not pretty. They, some aren't even straight. At that stage, I had never heard of street photography. To me, photography was portraits and landscape photography. So it never occurred to me that street photography is something I would do, but I learned that there is something called that. After a year or two, maybe, and that's a lot of photography courses and a lot of homework and going out and taking pictures. I, I just love the idea that it seemed like a sport, like a game. Sports was always a major thing in my life. And I really missed sports. And street photography felt like a sport to me. You go out, you hunt, maybe you'll get something, maybe you won't. Like most kids, I wanted to be a baseball player, a football player. Being a professional baseball player was really a goal. I would practice many hours a day. Played golf since the age of uh, nine or 10, yeah. I was very good. As a junior golfer, I was among the best. Unfortunately, I hit my peak at about age 21 and never really got much better after that. My skill in photography compared to golf is very little. But I'm afraid, like golf, my photography is going in the same direction. I hit a certain level and I don't, I don't go further. I wandered into ICP. I signed up for the very first basic course. And I remember the first day or maybe the second day in class, I went outside ICP with a camera, and I bought a camera for the class. I took a reflection of myself in the building of ICP, and then I went to the computer. I'd never done this before. I never put a card in a computer, never seen a picture in a computer. 
and I was amazed. I thought I was just taking my reflection in the ICP window, but instead there was that, there was a pigeon flying, there was this and that, all other stuff. And I thought, this is fantastic. And I literally fell in love with it right then, at that point. However, I couldn't work a camera. Computer, I didn't know how to use. Um, and my very first teacher, Chris Gilio, helped me a great deal, just learning how to use a camera, learning that uh, you turn a computer on this way and you put a card in that way. And uh, I just didn't stop. I took courses at ICP for nine years, nonstop. It's a rare example when people linger on the street. In New York, very few people hang out. They're constantly walking, looking at their phones and walking. But Kate Moss, the model Kate Moss, was about to come out of a hotel, so there was a crowd. I just turned around and took a picture of the crowd. And I like it because it's a lot of people and they each have their own space. I have to get some good shots while it's time. I don't have years. So every time I go out, I'm hoping to find something good. But I go out with the intention of shooting and nothing else, I'd say a good five times every week. Easy for me to look at people. I can find them a block away, I see them. I mean, I see the right person. But I think visually it's very difficult for me to look at a, look and see a complex scene. I think that's a different way of seeing. Boy, if I could do that, get multiple things going on. Someone here, someone there, bird flying by. Uh, that's what I wanted. And built into that goal is failure for two reasons. My fallback position is, oh, there's an interesting person on the street. I'm going to get that picture. And I become good at that. So that's my fallback. I, I was very proud that I can get really close, closer than anybody and without people knowing it, take their picture. Or even if they do know it, take it and move on. At some point it hit home, this isn't what I really want to do. This is what I'm getting to be good at. But what I really want to do is have street scenes where multiple things are going on at the same time. Foreground, middle ground, background. And I think seeing Alex Webb's pictures, from a certain point on, I, I went out trying to do that. And of course, I can never do it. I've gotten into a lot of shows. I've even won a few things. And to give that up is hard. Now, I don't have to give it up. I could do both. But I do think I have to force myself to at least temporarily stop taking pictures of individual people. I think there are some challenges to making street photography today, and one of them is the awareness of the public and the way the public has become more leery about photographers and about being photographed in the public space. I think it's harder to, to find that kind of unique uh, inspiration to be interested in almost anything now because images of everything are out there in, in a kind of flood tide every day. So it's harder to make a significant image and it's also harder to see one because you're numbed by the onslaught of imagery that contemporary media uh, creates. Well, I do notice that people get more uptight being photographed on the street than they used to. And it, in some ways it's become more difficult to shoot on the street because people are afraid they'll see their, their, their image or up on the internet. 
Even though we have more cameras than ever before, and we have more people making photographs than ever before, there seems to be a sort of increasing suspicion of the photographer in the public space also. Uh, including so much has been done in street photography. So it's kind of like amazing to me that, um, um, that uh, we do street photography because so much has been done by great, such great talents, you know. You know, has everything been photographed? Probably. Everything's been done, but not by me. I've met so many street photographers out on my favorite corners in the city. The vast majority, I think, who are young enough to be my children. Would I have liked to start it younger? Yes, but then I wouldn't have had all the experiences that I've had in my life, which I think who we are and the experiences we've had in our lives are what drive how we notice and react to things. So my experience raising my own children and seeing my young grandchildren informs how I respond to this or that child on the street or how parents are holding their hands or it's my life experience brings me to a place where my own life and things that I've experienced can, can become those triggers that make me notice something in that moment. Someone who hasn't that, had that experience might not be triggered or tripped by that little thing going on over here. I came to photography pretty late in life. After a career in finance, um, decided to spend more time at home with my children. I had worked very long hours for quite a number of years, and it's hard not to work. I mean, when you work, you have a paycheck, you have many people telling you you're doing a great job and you're talented and capable, and children generally don't, your own children don't tell you that you're talented and capable and doing a great job, quite the opposite. So just very slowly, photography became a very important part of being a happy person in the world. When I was able to start spending more time in Manhattan, the street is what drew me in. I had taken a workshop with Joel Meyerowitz, and something he said just turned a switch in my brain, and that was a sculptor can do a portrait, a painter can do a landscape and a portrait, but you know, of all the art forms that photography, what it owns itself is those moments on the street. Nothing but the camera can freeze that fraction of a second of real life. I'm an introverted person. I was very shy at first out on the streets, and it literally took me a couple years to take pictures without people noticing me and start to get the rhythm of the street to get to the point where I could create something, create something that interested me. And it's an ongoing process. In the beginning, there's some real fear about taking pictures of strangers and what are they going to think of me and what are they going to say to me? And will, you know, will someone lash out at me? And it's just the practice of doing it over and over again that you come to realize that if your body language is right and your confidence is there, most people don't notice you at all. Then you learn if people do notice you and ask you, you know, why did you take my picture? Any situation, almost every situation I've ever encountered is solved with a smile and a compliment. I've diffused almost every situation with a smile and a compliment. I said, Why did you take my picture? Someone will say. And I said, well, you're, you have the most marvelous manicure. I just wanted a picture of it. And, and all of a sudden, people are like, well, thank you. A smile and a compliment, that's 99% of the battle. I find this an interesting photograph that make it a bit of a touchstone for me. The children um, in their very protective, you, you, see you see parents and children walking through the city and the parents always are clutching and protecting their children in the busy city, which I think just in and of itself is a beautiful family, parent, child moment. So I love how, how tender he is with his daughters. Um, but most of all, what I enjoy about it is that the children are the only one who notice me taking a picture. And that's always a reminder for me to remain, to keep that childlike wonder about the world. Try to notice everything around you. For many street photographers, pictures are harmed if there's eye contact, if the, if the subject notices the street photographer. In this one, I don't find it so because 
for me, the picture is a reminder to, to look at the world with the freshness of a child and to be as observant as a child. I'm Matthias Wasik. I'm a photographer originally from Germany. It wasn't like a conscious decision. It wasn't like, okay, I arrive in New York and I'm gonna be a street photographer. It wasn't like that at all. And so when I arrived here in 2015, the first thing I shot was, you know, just like the typical touristy stuff. Maybe like more sophisticated touristy stuff. Like, you know, I was fascinated with the city, with, um, with the sites. So I would go and, you know, shoot the typical, um, you know, sites that, that are around in the city that everyone knows. I was walking around, I realized that, you know, the city is full of interesting characters, interesting people. So I, I was shooting more of that as well without really being aware of what I'm doing. And then at some point I ran into uh, Chris Voss, who is one of the members of the um, NYC SBC of the street photography community here. So we just, like, you know, started talking about shooting in the city and then he told me about the NYC SBC meetings um, that are being held once a month and he invited me uh, so I went and I realized that there's you know a whole world of this street photography thing happening without me ever noticing and at those meetings people would show their photos and discuss them and critique them um, and I realized wow that's what what I want to do I originally perceived the city as the subject as you know the subject of my of my work of what i wanted to 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 shoot and then i realized that the city and its buildings its streets are actually just the backdrop to um, the theater of life in the city right like the the, the people their emotions all those all those weird scenes that are happening in, in the streets of new york every day this is actually what's what's interesting this is what i want to put in the foreground of my work your location, the, the world you live in, always has an influence on you. It's not just being in a different place, it's also the people you meet. And I think there was like a moment where I had almost like an epiphany. Um, there is this one shot um, of, of, an, of an older man with a sandwich and, and a drink uh, who I saw near Times Square. And I think there was like one of those moments where I like, this is such a you know interesting person, such an interesting little New typical New York scene. Um, I want to get this shot and then I you know stepped right in front of him and took the photo and you know smiled at him after I took the photo and took off and I was I think I was so happy with that shot with that specific portrait that I realized okay I, I can do this and I want to do more of this Street photography was always, to some extent, a kind of cult thing, but a cult thing that gained a wider public audience than the cult that really was devoted to it. So from the late 80s until the, you know, the birth of the digital age, and I would say even far into the digital age, like probably even into the 2000s, street photography was uh, almost non-existent. But then starting about, it seems like about 10 years ago, but particularly like five years ago, it just exploded. Clearly, you know, Instagram and social media have, have fueled it. It's made it explode almost too much, but it helped me. But I think the biggest uh, concoction uh, that we have is, is social media and more specifically Instagram and the, and the vehicle of delivery and the manner of how it presents itself there. Now there is certainly a glut of millions of images out there coming all the time. It makes it more difficult to see the good photographs. We have to look through 
so much. The reason I didn't know what street photography was specifically is because I wasn't on social media at the time and I was looking at photo books. Nothing was labeled street photography. Well, at first I started with social media to share photos of my kids and life and very kind of friends and family. Now I hardly share any of that stuff and it's just photos, photos, photos and I won this and I'm doing this and now I'm just I'm the worst. <laughs> and then when I got on social media, I started seeing all my friends who photographed there on this street site and this, and I started joining them, those sites, and seeing all of this photography. So, but, but that's also how I started learning and getting better. Social media changes everything because some people really want that instantaneous fame and then they're posting five or ten shots a day on Instagram and, and, and they're posting everything. Not, not necessarily very good work and it's, uh, it is very strange, you know, because I don't know, I've never seen anything like it. Social media should be used as a tool in the photographer's toolbox for promotion and marketing purposes, but not necessarily an end destination for work. A lot of photographers today, I find a lot of amateur photographers, are shooting for social media. It's really uh, hardening to see uh, so many people shooting on the street again. I remember, you know, me and my friends talking in the late 80s, like, you know, when is street photography going to come back? When's it going to come back? And year after year, it just didn't come back. And then all of a sudden, it just came back in a big, big, big way. I think just the availability of the cell phone, very often people will start with a cell phone. That in itself is revolutionary, and perhaps even more revolutionary for me is the use of a cell phone or a smartphone as camera. Not only is everyone carrying a camera in their pocket, but everyone is now able to make good photographs. And that wasn't always the case. Each person who takes pictures, no matter how casually, with his cell phone, nonetheless thinks about photography and what a photograph means and how it's a record of history and things like that. And however casually they may think that way, it widens their interest in photography in general. However, I'm a little bit suspicious from time to time about some of the things I see. I'm beginning to think that some pictures are set up. I see that more and more. I don't want to name any names, you know, but, you know, I see it in my Instagram feed. I see pictures that feel fishy to me. They feel too perfect. So it's a little bit hard to know in this age what's genuine and what is not. But still, you know, that asks another question that's important, which is, does it matter? Does it matter if a photo is even set up? The number one trolling comment all over social media and sometimes in person is, this is bullshit, this is a posed photograph, he's lying. I get it all the time. I love it now. At first, oh my gosh, at first when I was so, I was so insecure and I thought my career was over when people were saying that, um, but I love it now. This photo right here, this is probably what really kick-started everything, what really lit the fire under my career. It won the um, World Street Photography Awards 2015 prize, which is the cover. I've sold so many prints of it, so this is probably the predominant reason that we are here today. But um, when this happened with his blue camera, her, his positioning, and I knew right away, my gut was telling me that this was the one, and then I wrapped that scene and moved on. My process involves mostly looking for an interesting background. Uh, I would like a bigger element. I don't like text. I want bold color and geometry. So that's the stuff I'm predominantly looking for, whether it's an advertisement or a street art or whatever. I always have my radar up for that. After I find these elements that I get a good feeling for, I return to the spot. So I usually return every afternoon I can for up to, the longest I've ever gone is for four months. It's for a photo called Wall Street where a, a dude in a business suit has a rope coming out of his head. That took four months. I was almost done with it before that happened, but I'm glad I stuck through it. The number one thing that keeps me from getting a shot that I like is the busyness of New York sidewalks. I will be ready to take the best shot ever and suddenly a person on a bike 
just right there and it's gone. That happens most of the time where a person walking through, that kind of stuff throws me off all the time. That's the major reason that I don't get a shot of light. Yes, Mama, have a good pride. I've always had a, a, a super vivid imagination. I think it helped when I was a kid and was having trouble with being closeted. I took lots of Polaroid pictures. I was really into Polaroids when I was a kid. Um, but then adolescence, when I uh, started to understand that I was gay and um, dealt with coming out to friends and family and the 80s and the Bible Belt, that was kind of a, a shit show. So I think that's kind of when I started fantasizing and dreaming about moving to New York or moving to other places um, just to get by through day-to-day -day school stuff. Oh, I see something I want to move toward. That woman's white shirt with pink stripes matched the pattern very well. We'll see how that turns out. I remember uh, when I was like 13, my mother and my grandmother sat me down at our kitchen table and they said, um, basically, is, is there anything you want to tell us? Um, <laughs> we love you no matter what, uh, but we think that you might be going through something. And of course, I just immediately started bawling. They gave me an opening to release everything. Uh, so I, I confirmed that I was gay. It started out well, that was really cool. That was great of them, but it didn't, it didn't continue to go that way. They were sure that it was a phase and that I would be into girls soon and then I'd get over it, uh, which, which uh, internalized a lot of shit for me since I knew it wasn't a phase. Uh, it was tough, man. So um, I only, I never knew any gay people except for um, the ones on TV. And they were always in, in the 80s, like on Geraldo, they were all, always the ones who were suffering from AIDS or cross-dressers, you know, always that kind of stuff. Uh, so that was really my only exposure to gay people. Until high school, there was one other gay person, um, Chris, I remember his name. And uh, that was, I met him right after I came out to my mother and grandmother. Uh, and so I met him and of course I latched onto him for dear life. He was like my lifeline out of depression. I had a big journal, I remember, and I wrote LA on one section, San Francisco on another section, and, in, and New York on another, and I listed the pros and cons of moving to the mall. And this was probably four years before I even moved to LA. I dropped out of high school. Um, the, the bullying was so bad that I couldn't do it anymore. Even though I was a pretty good student, I had to get the F out of there. Okay. If she wants to be in my shot, that's fine with me. We're just taking pictures around the neighborhood. Do you live here? Yeah. Uh, no, I live here. I live up the street. Yeah. <laughs> Amazing. Literally. Good. Yeah, I like sharp. Sharp light. Um, but this is good. I mean, overcast is also good. Street photography is hard because you can't always pull out that perfect moment, even if you see it with your eyes. I'm interested in that kind of gathering of people for sometimes random reasons, you know, like. Christopher Columbus Day. Like, that's, what is that? But everybody's out and they're wearing their outfits and the flags and I love the movement and uh, sort of like watching people play out tradition or sort of like, well, like, 
every 4th of July we eat this and we go here. I love that kind of idea of cultural traditions and how they play out, what they look like. Um, so yeah, photographing those kinds of events is, is great for me because it's a real like display of what people in this country do or what they place value on or, or what like our society says is important and like what we should celebrate and what we should eat and wear and all that. I think that's fascinating. I'm lucky to be able to make money with my camera. So, because I, I wasn't always able to do that. So I don't have to be a bartender anymore, stuff like that, which is nice. Like if people ask me what kind of photography I do, I, I say I'm a street photographer and then I say, you know, documentary kind of stuff. Like, I don't know, people attach to different terms or ideas of what they think. I've always shot film on the street. I think it looks better. And I like the lag time of taking a picture and then seeing it later on and not immediately. Film to me is still way more beautiful than digital. I think it would be kind of ignorant and maybe not open-minded enough to, to embrace what is new. For me, the encounter and engagement with the, with the cell phone, in my case, mostly with the iPhone, has been an extraordinary liberation for a man that's been using Leica and SLRs in the streets for almost maybe even 40 years. Well, I take six months sometimes to get to my photos because I'm always backed up. I have like 30 or 40 folders on my desktop, at least with two, 3,000 photos. It's like, oh my God, I can't even go through a folder in one night. And then the next day I take another bunch of photos and tomorrow there's going to be a protest. And if I go to the protest, I'm going to take another thousand photographs. Yesterday I took a thousand photos. So organizing photos as a street photographer when you regularly get a thousand photos is a nightmare. We use like a NASI drive, I think it's called, with like 70, 100 billion terabytes of storage, I think is the right number. <laughs> and um, I, I, I try not to toss anything. A lot of street photographers uh, will, in certain situations, just hold that button down and then find the picture later. Now photographers can go out and shoot 300 pictures a day if they want to, and then what they often do is kind of thumb through them at the end of the day and throw a lot of it away. Big mistake, I think. Well, it wasn't really until I got an uh, iPhone, right when iPhones came out, whatever year that was, and um, started taking pictures with my phone, I thought, oh, digital has some potential after all. The iPhone was kind of my gateway camera from film to digital. I've been shooting digital ever since, and I really, really like it. It's so accessible and it's immediate. When Joel was starting out in street photography and through the whole film era, uh, he would go out with maybe uh, two rolls of film, one black and white and one color, and he, so he might shoot 72 pictures in a day if he was really busy. I think that you grow as a photographer when you learn how to discipline yourself to only make pictures that truly have intent. Not necessarily that you know exactly what you want before you push the button, but that you do have some kind of intent, some uh, psychological and aesthetic structure for what you're doing. And the fact that a contemporary photographer can shoot so many pictures at a time, and some people who think they're street photographers will go out and just hold their finger down on the button, hoping that they get something good in the, you know, as, as the shots are, are being fired off. I hope I'm not sounding like a broken record. But you can go take thousands of pictures just like that. It's free, uh, it's quick, it's instant. Uh, it has its technical uh, inadequacies, uh, which took me a while to adjust to. Street photography is connection. Sort of photography is an extension of that curiosity into how a different society or culture works and or doesn't, how it's dysfunctional. It's a bit of an addiction, street photography. As frustrating as it can be, I mean, to be out on, the, on a hot day for six hours and you're wilted, it's all worth it if you caught a really special moment. It feels good. 
The camera feels good. The search feels good. The possibility of a good result feels good. As a commodity in the art market, historical street photography has some traction, but it doesn't as a contemporary art form. But street photographers all over the world stay in touch with each other on the web, and the, there's, there's no danger at all that this genre is going to sort of die away. If anything, there are more people out there making more pictures in this genre now than ever before. There's things that you do in life you do because it makes your life feel purposeful and because it feels like you're contributing in some odd way to society as a society is giving back to you. I think it's an exciting time uh, to be in uh, as a street photographer or any other kind of photographer, but I think particularly as a street photographer. One lover in my bed, one 